Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all therein, saying to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor glory and might forever and forever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and they worshiped and this is a picture this is a glimpse of eternity it's a moment in time where we can see what eternal worship around the throne of the lamb looks like from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every language, every people, from all over the world and throughout history, those redeemed by the blood of Christ, now gathered before his throne. And they don't look alike. And they speak different languages. And they're from different places. And they've lived different lives. Many of them have never had the chance to meet one another. Many of them have lived and died before others had even been born. But now there they are. Every one of them who have been redeemed by God, gathered around the throne, and no matter where they come from, no matter when they live, their voices join in unity in this moment of eternal praise. And when we come together on a Sunday morning and we offer the prayers and we sing the songs and we celebrate the sacraments for just a moment, our voices join with theirs. And it doesn't matter where we come from and it doesn't matter what sort of life we've lived and it doesn't matter when we've lived, where we've lived, who we are. We stand for that moment around the throne of the Lamb. Our voices, our souls, unified in the praise of Christ. This moment, this glimpse that we see in Revelation 5, this is an eternal destiny. It is the hope of the Christian, and it is the culmination of the new creation. That through the resurrection of Christ, all things are being made new. And because of that, because of Him, we might gather in that time and in that place and offer our own lives and our own words of worship and praise <coughs> now and forever. The last week I mentioned that the second Sunday of the Easter season, we always get the same gospel reading. No matter what the other lessons happen to be in our, our lectionary cycle, it's always doubting Thomas. We always have that resurrection appearance where the, the disciples who are hiding away in the upper room behind the locked door and they're terrified and they're frightened and they're confused that Jesus appears to them and offers them his peace. And Thomas isn't there. And so when they try to talk to Thomas, he says, come on now, just get over it. He's dead. Unless I can touch the holes, put my hand on his side. And sure enough, the next time Thomas is there, there is Jesus, Thomas. Come here. <coughs> Here, Thomas, put your hands on these holes. Put it in the side with a spear. That's where the spear was, Thomas. Do not doubt but believe. And Thomas responds in the only way that anyone could, the only way that we could. My Lord and my God, he just worships. So that second, that second Sunday always takes us to this moment, this resurrection moment, where we can be reminded that even the glorified body of Christ, right, his body and his soul, eternally united. This is the Lamb who sits upon the throne. That He bears wounds. And, and I told you that this is such a significant moment for me because I take great comfort and even some courage and be reminded that the resurrected and glorified body bears wounds. That in the resurrection, it doesn't wipe away all the bad things that happens. It redeems them. <coughs> That Jesus can point to a hole in his hand, and we don't have to think just about the cruel nails. 
We don't have to think just about his suffering and his pain and his death. They are now tokens of victory. These are now signs of his triumph. And they can be for us, too, that through the resurrection, Jesus doesn't wipe away all the stuff that's happened to us. Our lives are still filled with hurt and loss and pain. We still cause hurt and loss and pain to other people. He doesn't just wipe it all the way and the sense of it never happened. He doesn't hop into a time machine and go back into time and make sure that we turn left instead of right. He doesn't give us the chance to hit a giant celestial rewind button, so and then we can do the right thing. He takes what we have done, left undone. He takes what we have done to others that we should not have done in ways that we have sinned against God himself and hurt one another, and he redeems them. No longer just signs the scars that we can bear on our heart or on our mind. No longer just gaping holes that we can look at and see this terrible thing happen to me or this horrible burden I've carried for so long that they too can be signs of God's triumph. Look at what the Lord has done for me. Glorified to now point to his grace and to his power. And this reading that we have today takes that moment and brings it to a slightly different direction. Now, Jesus makes a resurrection appearance, and the disciples are basically getting back to work. They're, they're, they're kind of trying to get back to some sort of normalcy of life. You know, when in doubt, fishermen got to fish. So, you know, he's, Jesus is alive. I'm still not sure what to do. So what do you guys want to do? Go fishing? Yeah, okay, let's go fishing. So they go fishing. And Jesus appears to them. And in this moment that we see, there is a miracle that happens. It's a small miracle. But what's interesting about it is it connects to something that's already happened. So earlier in his ministry and earlier in their lives, Jesus does the exact same thing. Remember, he tells them they haven't been catching fish all day long. And he says, cast your net to the other side. And once they obey him, suddenly they have so many fish, the nets are about to break and the boat is about to sink. So in this brief moment, <gasps> Oh, I know who that is. I mean, that's kind of what it is, right? That the, the whole resurrected, glorified body, sometimes they can tell it's Jesus and sometimes they can't. Well, he reproduces a miracle and it reminds them, oh, it's Jesus again. Yes. And so they go back to the shore and they meet him. But what I think is so significant about this passage is really that end part. It's almost like two stories smushed together. And it's this end part that I think connects so powerfully with what we read last week. Jesus and Peter have the chance to talk. Now, if they have spoken to one another personally and privately at some point, we have no idea. What is recorded is that they finally do speak here. So, for the last time since, you know what, Monday, Thursday, Jesus and Peter are speaking. And Jesus says, Peter... Do you love me? Yeah, of course I do. Jesus, I love you. Okay, then feed my sheep. Oh, by the way, Peter, do you love me? I, I just told you that I love you. Yes, yes, I love you. Okay, okay, good. Then tend my lambs. Oh, Peter, one more question. Yes, Lord? Do you love me? Jesus, come on. I mean, I, I, I just said it like 30 seconds ago. I've said it twice now. Of course I love you. Of course, of course. I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus says, then, to my flock. And then Jesus offers this brief little prophecy of how Peter will die. If you do not know the story, Peter will spend a lifetime now preaching and proclaiming the resurrected Christ as an old man who will be led to die. He will be crucified just as his Lord was. If any of you have seen the upside down cross and thought, oh, it's the devil, maybe not. Sometimes you'll see it on the, like the stuff about the Pope, sits in the chair of Peter. Peter says, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner that my Lord was. Turn me upside down. 
You see an upside down cross. Don't think Satan first. Think the humility of Peter that says, if you're going to kill me, fine. I will die for Jesus, but I am not worthy to die upright like he did. Flip me upside down and kill me that way. So, we get this little moment here where Jesus says, this is how you are going to die. You will be a martyr to the faith. And we can ask, what, what, what's going on? It's almost an odd, weird, strange moment. Why keep asking? Jesus is not forgetful. So is he like trying to annoy Peter? <coughs> is he just trying to, to poke at him or make him feel bad? I mean, if, if, if say, your wife or your husband or even one of your kids say, well, do you love me? You say, yes, I love you. And they ask you 30 seconds later, but do you love me? You say, Yes, I just told you 30 seconds ago. And if they wait another 30 seconds and say, but do you love me? You start getting mad. Of course. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Yes, I love you. Why are you doing that? But that's not what's happening here. I think it's, it's something else altogether. So, since we do not have any record of Jesus and Peter sharing a moment or a conversation just between the two of them until this moment, why don't we just take it that they have not spoken since Monday, Thursday? At the very least, this is what we are given about how they do interact. So think about what their last time together looked like. They had this last supper. Their feet have been washed. They have shared body and blood. And then Jesus is arrested. He's there praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Peter and James and John, they're too tired to even stay and pray with him. They fall asleep. And so the soldiers come and arrest him. They take him to this first introductory trial so that he has to go to the high priest and make an account for himself. And eventually he'll be taken to the Romans. He will be tortured. He will be crucified and die. And what happens with Peter? Hey, uh, aren't you with him? Nope. Uh-uh. I'm not with him. The, the guy the soldiers just took away and something bad's going to happen to? Nope. I'm just at some innocent bystander. Okay. But, but, but wait a second. I can hear your accent. You sound like you come from the same town. Are you sure you're not with that guy, Jesus? Oh, totally not me. I am not with Jesus. You're thinking about some other guy. And then just a little while later, are you? No, no, no. I know I saw you with him. Shouldn't you be on trial with him? Shouldn't you be up there with him? Don't they have some questions to ask you? Because maybe you're going to suffer the same fate as him. And he says, I swear to you, I have never seen that guy before in my life. May I be cursed if I am telling a lie. <coughs> and then the cop crows. He remembers. Earlier that night, Jesus had said, before the cock crows, he will deny me three times. And he did. He did. Peter is one of Jesus' closest friends. He has been there time after time. He has heard the lessons. He has seen the miracles. He has been with Jesus in the greatest of moments and in the quietest of times. Peter has walked on the water thanks to Jesus. And in his moment of greatest need, in his moment of public proclamation, Peter says, I swear, I've never seen this guy before in my life. Now, if you had asked Peter a week before, I know he's the sort of guy who said, oh, I would totally stand up for Jesus. Are you kidding me? Man, bring on the swords. I don't care. He's my God. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. I will never deny him, except when push came to shove, Peter falls over. The greatest of moments and the most precious of times, one of Jesus' closest friends abandons him to save his own skin. Never met the guy before in my life. I swear, curse me if I'm telling him. Now, that's pretty serious stuff. And now Jesus asks, do you love me? And Peter gets to say, yes. Yes. Now, in essence, this terrible story has all come out all right. 
Jesus has conquered death. He is victor over the grave, never to die again. The first fruits of the new creation, the resurrection, is our eternal hope and promise. But what Peter said and did, he still said, and he still did. Do you know this man? No, I don't know. Aren't you one of them because I think I recognize your voice? Nope, never heard of it. Are you sure? I swear I have seen you with this guy. I swear I have never heard him before. And curse me if I'm wrong. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? For the three times that Peter denies, Jesus asks him three times about his love, seeking to restore Peter. In his redemption, what Peter has done wouldn't just be wiped away or winked about or kind of uncomfortable, like, yeah, let's just not talk about that, but actually dealt with and healed. And we know, kind of on a practical sense, when we have hurt someone or someone has hurt us, that sense of awkwardness about it. We kind of just want to let bygones be bygones at times, or, or just you know, water under the bridge or whatever. I don't really want to deal with this because it's hard. And it's, it's awkward and I feel bad. You know, somebody hurts you and they say, I'm sorry. We know that we tend to reflexively respond. That's okay. Don't worry about it. That's over. Okay, good. I'm glad that's over. Except, of course, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Because if you just sort of dismiss what's happened or you tried to wave it away, maybe it hasn't been dealt with. Maybe it hasn't been reconciled. Maybe it hasn't been healed. And you carry that inside of you. Rather than offering true forgiveness, having that relationship redeemed and restored, you carry this little piece deep down inside because it's never really been dealt with. It's never really been talked about. You've never really had it out. And then the next time something like that happens, don't you connect those pieces? Aha! Just like before. I knew you were that kind of person. You said you weren't going to do it anymore, and you did it again, you did it again. Right? Doesn't that say you've been carrying this inside? You've been carrying a burden inside of you? You've been not offering forgiveness, and that relationship was not? But I want us to think about the other side for a moment. If you have ever hurt someone else, you've really let them down, you've said the wrong thing, you have offended them, broken them in some manner. Now let's say they never bring it up, but they kind of make nice, like everything is okay. Think about for a moment how you feel. Think about the anxiety that you care. Um, are we really okay, or are they just acting okay? Um, should I bring it up, or should I just kind of just let it lie? Um, maybe they don't know what I did. And should I say something, or if it comes out later from someone else, maybe it's going to be worse. But if there's no kind of meeting of the minds, if there's no laying your cards on the table, if there's no sort of overt forgiveness and reconciliation, you too can carry those burdens with you. Because you can't make it not have happened, but now without something overt, you carry that sense of anxiety or that shame or that guilt. But we don't want to really work this out with each other at times because it is awkward and it is hard. It's hard to love someone enough to say, look, let's bring this up and let's hash this out. It's so much easier to say, oh, it's okay, or just to kind of pretend like it never happened, or to just kind of play nice. And yet, as Christians, we are called to the sort of sacrificial love that says it is worth it. You are worth it. Let's work this out. Let's make this better. Let's make this right. I desire to be reconciled to you and our relationship be restored. Not that those bad things go away, but like the wounds of Christ, even on his glorified body, redeemed to point not just to loss and pain, 
but the triumph and power of God. For those relationships or those hurts, those actions that we've done or those ways that we have disappointed and hurt others, not just wiped away, but still there, yet redeemed by God so they're no longer just stories of our own failings, but they now point to God's triumph. You see, how can Peter, if he doesn't have this moment, go preach and teach the gospel of Christ for the rest of his life and even be willing to be a martyr to that faith? How can he preach to Israel and the Gentiles if deep down inside of him he still feels the shame that at the moment of moments I turned my back on my Lord and even though he was willing to die for me, I swore up and down I'd never met. How can he preach with integrity if he carries that shameful secret inside of him? So instead, Jesus says, we lay our cards on the table. I know what you've done. And now I restore you and redeem you. And now Peter can even tell this story. This story is a part of our gospel account. Not just about Peter's shame and failure, but about the triumph of Christ, about the power of his grace, about how no one is so far that they cannot be redeemed. Now Peter can tell this story. Okay, I'm telling you about Jesus, but you're thinking, oh, but there are these things that I've done, and if God really knew, he would let me into his kingdom. i got to tell you, I was one of his best friends. And when they came for him, when I had the chance, to say, this is who he is and this is who I am, I failed and I let him down and I turned my back on my own Lord. And you know what he did? He loved me. You know what he did? He forgave me. You know what he did? He restored me. Because that's how Jesus works. He worked for me and he can do that for you. This now becomes a story, not just of human failure, not just of sin of its most egregious sort, but about the true nature of grace and the power of the resurrection. This is what the Lord has done for me. Our first reading, we don't even call that guy Saul anymore. He got a brand new name because he meets Jesus and his past, like his future, is redeemed. Saul, who just one chapter before what we read today, just one chapter. He will be present for when the crowd takes our patron, Stephen, and crushes the life out of him with stones. They will strip his body bare and throw the clothing in front of this man Saul. So Saul can say, good job. Way to kill that Christian. Saul, persecutor of the church, Saul, who is looking to find Christians no matter where they are, so the same thing can happen to them as happened to Stephen, meets the resurrected Lord. And Jesus changes and transforms him, redeems Saul. He becomes Paul. He writes most of the New Testament. He will teach us how Christ is both the, the Passover sacrificial lamb and he is also the eternal high priest. And he's not there hiding his own shame. He's not there hiding his own past. But now it becomes a mark of God's triumph. I was a persecutor of the church, Paul can write. I was the worst of the worst of the worst. But this is what Jesus does. He takes our worst and offers his best. He redeems us and he restores us. And through the power of his resurrection, even the awful stuff that I've done no longer points to me and how rotten I am. Now it points to God and how righteous, how holy, how gracious, and how good he is. So when we say that around the throne of the Lamb, people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation, all that kind of stuff, and I say that there are people who have all sorts of lives, who have led all sorts of things, there are people around the throne who have done the best and who have done the worst. Just like in our own lives, 
We've had moments of great joy and moments of terrible pain or loss or suffering or things that we have done that we just wish nobody would know about. But now no longer shameful, no longer secret, surrounding the throne of the Lamb, restored into the family of God and offering praise. Not ashamed of what they have done, but in joy for what God has done for them. These stories aren't wiped away, they are redeemed. They are not erased. We are restored. Even our old actions, our own old life, and our old sin, we can point to those stories and say, look at what the Lord has done for me. Therefore, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy who sits upon the throne, surrounded by countless thrones with their best with their worst, with our best and worst as well. For worthy is the Lamb who was slain, for by His blood we have been redeemed, by His blood we have been forgiven, by His blood we have been restored.